Well, welcome again to Messages of Hope from Pepperdine University. This is Jeff Walling, and this is lesson number 12 in this series during the coronavirus lockdown and now gentle reopening of 2020. Well, Memorial Day was last Monday, a day when we remember losses and the cost of the freedoms that we have. But the flags were at half-mast last Monday for another reason. They were also at half-mast because of the 100,000 people who have now lost their lives in the coronavirus. It's a number that is stunning. Now, I'm aware that there are many other causes of death that, uh, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine who said, do you know how many people get killed in car wrecks every year? And, and I get it. But that's not the only loss of life that this last week has brought to bear. A death of a man in Minneapolis uh, in an incident with a policeman who had his knee on his neck has broken the hearts of America, has ripped apart a city, and reminds us that loss is always all around us, and that trying to deal with it in a godly and Christian way is so important. So our prayers go out to all those who are frightened, to all those who have asked themselves, is it even safe for me to be in America, and especially people of color? Our prayers go out to those who are in a position to change things. And our prayers go out to those who are serving as policemen and first responders in different ways. For at times, it's hard for us not to paint everybody with the same brush. So, may God bless them all. But that's not the only loss that we were thinking about this week. A few days ago, Hertz Rental Company went bankrupt or declared bankruptcy along with a number of others who in recent weeks have said, you know what, this just does us in. J.C. Penney and Neiman Marcus. It's one of those moments when loss is all around us, from a physical loss and a financial loss and an experiential loss. Time Magazine had a cover of graduates who were saying, wow, you know, so much for graduation, right? We missed our graduation here at Pepperdine, and it doesn't look like we're going to be able to do a giant graduation on campus this year. High school graduates all across the country not only missed proms and missed graduation, but now many Christian summer camps and other summer events have been closed. Wow, loss, loss, and loss. And somebody says, which of those is the greatest loss? Well, I'll tell you what the greatest loss is, in my opinion. It's actually none of those. In fact, the greatest loss that many have been struggling with is a loss that Paul talks about when he writes a letter to the church in Corinth. The second Corinthian letter, in four, the fourth chapter and first verse, begins with these words. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Could it be that the greatest loss we face is a loss of heart? Paul uses this phrase a couple of times in this chapter, and for today's lesson, we'll just take a peek at those two little moments. What does it mean to lose heart? I think when we hear it, we immediately grab onto the emotional side of it, but I think there's both an intellectual side and an emotional side. It's when we feel like, man, are things ever going to change? Is truth ever going to prevail? Is what I'm doing going to make a difference? Now, we feel that way right now with the coronavirus and the shutdown, but what about spiritually? What about when you feel like, man, is my being faithful, is my trying to follow Jesus going to even make a difference in this world? And I think there's a lot of us that ask those questions today. Paul certainly, in one way, was wrestling with those same questions with the church in Corinth. Quick piece of background. All right, Corinth was a very important city, a city that Paul loved and administered in. But also, it was a city that was filled with the tension of the Roman gods and, quite frankly, what people wanted. There were temple prostitutes, as well as people who would argue that Paul had no authority. Now, those people were actually within the church. And when he writes the letters of 1st and 2nd Corinthians, you can kind of feel the tensions between them, especially in 2nd Corinthians, a letter that Paul writes to that church in many ways defending his identity, defending his apostleship. Because it seems there were people at that church who were questioning, Paul, are, are you really a man of God? Are you really worthy of telling us what to do? Are your motives really pure? Now, 
Any of us who have ever been challenged about who we are knows what it feels like to say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> I was on a plane. It's been a long time since I've been on a plane, but I was on a plane a while back. Sat down by somebody. I was flying from Charlotte, North Carolina to Los Angeles. And a lady sat down next to me and, you know, you start the conversation. Hi, what's your name? And then where are you from? And I said, oh, I'm from California. And she looked me up and down and said, hmm, you don't look much like a Californian. Now, I didn't know how to respond. I thought, is that a compliment? Or is she saying, most Californians look really cool and you don't? <laughs> I'm guessing it was the latter. But for me, I found myself getting defensive. Well, hey lady, I was born in California. I was raised in California. I've lived the majority of my life in California. Somebody could have tapped me on the shoulder and said, whoa, buddy, don't lose heart here. Don't let this get to you. And Paul certainly doesn't become super defensive. Well, he becomes a bit defensive. But I think what he does, even when we hear his humanity in the text, is to help us deal with the issue of losing heart and how to respond. Because for Paul, I think losing heart is a vision problem. It is a matter of how we look at a situation. Once again, listen to his words. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Did, did, you, did you hear that moment? Therefore, since through God's mercy. Paul is going to underline for them that it's really not about me. It is God who has given me my ministry. It is God who gives us our gifts. It's the Lord who saves us and makes us Christian. You see, one of the challenges that we have is when our outer circumstances don't reflect our inner blessings. Well, I don't know, you know, look at all that's happening in the world. Do you really have a faithful God? Or, my goodness, look at the things that have happened in your life. You don't look like God's blessed people. Are you really one of God's persons? You see, we have a culture, we live in a culture, that focuses on the outside. You know, my wife can't wait to get to a hair salon. I talked to a friend the other day who said, I can't wait to get a manicure and a pedicure. And to be honest, maybe this weekend I might sneak up to Ventura County where the barber shops are open. Why? <laughs> Vanity. Because I want to look good. Because I want my outside to reflect what I hope God is doing on my inside. Now, while that may be a bit naive, it's also a bit treacherous. Because, you see, if I start worrying about my outside, both Paul and, of course, Jesus are going to raise a red flag and say, let me give you some warnings about bad vision. I, uh, I went a while back to get a new prescription and get glasses. It's amazing how they've automated things these days. I mean, you know, there's not much of the better, worse, better, worse that there used to be. But instead, you look in, zoom, 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 this machine, and boom, out comes your prescription. It's awesome. I thought, I'm going to be out of this optometrist appointment in maybe 10 or 15 minutes. Never before had that happened. And then they walked me over to the wall of frame choices. That's right. It has nothing to do with the lens. My prescription's already done. But it took me half an hour plus just to go through all the frames. Do you want a square one? Do you want a round one? Do you think you'll look better in one like this? I end up taking selfies and sending them to my wife and saying, Hey, honey, what do you think? Why? Because I was falling prey to the challenge of worrying more about how I looked than how I look. How I look than how I see. You tracking with me on this? Let me give you what I believe are Paul's warnings about bad vision. First, bad vision happens when looking good trumps being good. Listen to Paul's words that he continues his comments to them with. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. Now, why would Paul say, oh no, we've renounced secret and shameful ways? It's him both saying to them, and I think reminding himself, I'm not going to start doing bad things. I'm not going to start turning the shiny side of the cup out. I'm not going to put a coat of paint on a busted fence or lipstick on a pig, as my grandma would say, in order to make myself look good. Because then, looking good becomes my goal instead of being 
good. Oh, come on. You remember the moment. A car pulls up in front of the house and one of the kids say, Mom, it's Brother Bob or Pastor Bob. It's our preacher. And all of a sudden, oh, quick, you know, stuff things under the couch, make things look nice, or maybe it's Grandma and Grandpa that show up, or just a very put-together friend, and you find yourself running around the house trying to make everything hide the mess. Hide the mess has been a part of our world for years. And when looking good trumps being good, then we move to the warning number two, when covering up becomes commonplace. We've got bad vision. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden, right? It goes back to Adam and Eve saying, Oh, I don't want anybody to see my brokenness. Here's Jesus' words on it. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You're like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. Oh! It's the oldest trick in the book, right? It's Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. It's you and I trying to cover our mess. It's, <laughs> oh, I'll tell this. It's me walking through the Minneapolis airport. You know, the Minneapolis airport is huge and beautiful. But it's the only airport I've ever been in. My wife was with me when I walked past a shop and looked up, and the shop was a Spanx shop. Now, for the guys who don't know what Spanx is, spelled S-P-A-N-X, um, Spanx are like super duper tight t-shirts that kind of suck everything in. Now, I always thought Spanx was basically just a woman's girdle shop. But on the outside, there was this sign, New Men's T-shirts. I thought, what? We walked in. Well, before you know it, I'm back there in one of the dressing rooms trying one of these things on. I mean, it's pulling it. Oh, guys, I, I, I warn you. It's like somebody giving you a bear hug constantly. However, I got that thing on and looked in the mirror and went, Oh my word, I just lost 30 pounds. Yeah, I bought a Spanx. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just admitting. I don't wear it often because I have to hold my breath while I wear it. But I can see the allure of being able to just cover the mess, of put something on. And folks, much worse than my purchase, is our spiritual Spanx. It's when we feel like, whether it's when we come to church, or maybe when you're Zooming, or maybe when you're texting or Facebooking, that we want to make sure that nobody ever thinks we are hurting, or frustrated, or depressed, or angry, or bitter, or confused, or in a place where I think I've just made a wrong choice. As Christians, we don't need spiritual Spanx. We don't need to hide and paint white over the cemetery boxes as the Jews were doing. We don't need to pretend because through the grace of Christ, remember what Paul said? I have this ministry through God's grace. He told them he was a total mess. He writes that to the Corinthian church. Listen, I don't deserve to be called an apostle, so let me just follow right behind him. Folks, I don't deserve to be the guy in the camera in front of you. And neither does your local minister. And I'm hoping you're zooming into your church services every Sunday. This is just Bible class. I hope that you and I can take a moment to say, Yeah, I want to see clearly, God, that no spiritual spanks is ever going to cover anything up for you. And once I start covering and that becomes a habit, then I'm in danger. I'm in danger of falling into the third warning that Paul gives us. Bad vision takes place when reputation starts robbing our character. When I start doing things to look good that aren't just tucking the mess in, but are actually sin itself. When I start making choices, remember Paul's language about renouncing secret, shameful, and sinful ways? Listen to how he continues. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Paul says, listen, I'm not going to lie and pretend that I've got it all together because that gives the glory to me and not to God. Instead, he says, I'm going to renounce any desire to lie, to cheat, to turn the best side of the cup out. He said, in fact, I'm going to let you see that I'm a... I'm a broken jar. I'm a cracked pot. It's funny. That's where the light 
can come through, is those cracks a friend of mine likes to say. You see, Paul's message is that we will start losing heart when we think that the outside, that our circumstances, that our world has to look like the inside, the grace and forgiveness we have in Jesus. Oh, I believe the inside is going to bubble out, but folks, we live in a broken and busted planet, broken by sin, busted by our response, and because of all of that, our churches are never going to be great. Our country's never going to be great. Our lives are never going to be great. They're always going to be a mix of cracks and brokenness and blessings. And as Christians, that's our message. That's our celebration. Our mess becomes our message. As I like to say, that's why they call Jesus the Messiah, because He came to deal with our messes. So, Paul, do you have a prescription for us? You've given us a warning about our bad vision. I love his prescription because he again uses the phrase, don't lose heart, but this time, take a look at it at the end of chapter 4. Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Okay, Paul is setting up his prescription here by saying, look, we recognize that outside we are wasting away. We are wrinkling, we are graying, right? What of our hair isn't turning gray is turning loose. And so we acknowledge and embrace our brokenness. But he says that's not where we focus. That's not where we fix our eyes. Listen to this unique prescription. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what's seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Uh, i got to confess, this is one of my favorite passages from Paul. It's so simple. In fact, let me give it to you in closing. Paul says, in order to get good vision, close your eyes. Yeah, I know it's weird, but close your eyes. He says the best way to see what's important is with closed eyes. We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Why? Well, everything you see, Jeff, is temporary. That's right. Your body, this world, this country, all that you care about, all that you try and wash up and clean up and fix up, all that stuff is going to rot, is going to decay, is going to sag and wrinkle, and this is going to die. But the unseen, the part of you that you can't see, the part where Jesus lives within you, your eternal soul, that matters forever. And the part of the world that is the unseen part. I've never seen heaven. Don't know what a cherubim or a seraphim looks like. I've never seen God. But oh, how I believe that the unseen is what I need to be focusing on every day. Fix your eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Because then, we won't be so worried about how the outside looks. We'll even not be so needful and defensive of saying, well, I can explain why this loss or that loss is happening. Loss is real and it hurts. People make bad choices and it breaks the heart of the Father. But we get a chance to focus on the unseen, which will move us with patience and without giving up or losing heart to serving in the scene. I, I hope that makes sense to you. Maybe we can close by having you do something to make it really clear. Close your eyes. No, I'm serious. Maybe some of you who are watching this late at night have already closed your eyes. So go ahead, just join them. Close your eyes. Now with your eyes closed, think about what you can't see. All the stuff, all the challenges. You can't see your phone, you can't see your TV, and you can't see people around you that may have hurt you or situations around you that you don't like. But what can you see with your eyes closed? I hope you can see a God who loves you. I hope you can see eternity. I hope with your eyes closed you realize that you can look at your soul and say, God, this belongs to you and it has been bathed in the blood of Jesus. Open your eyes. <laughs> I hope a vision of what is unseen can guide us to good actions in what is seen. Because we're never going to look until heaven 
like who God has made us in Christ Jesus. My, uh, my wife enjoys jewelry. She doesn't have a lot of it, but she, she does enjoy jewelry. And a while back, I, I bought her what I thought was a beautiful jewelry box. She enjoyed putting all the pieces of jewelry she has in this box. But then I noticed we were heading away on a trip and she had mentioned, oh, I forgot something. I went to the jewelry box to get it and there was almost nothing in the jewelry box. And I said, it's not here. And she said, no, no, I don't keep that in there when we travel. She walked over to a sock drawer in one of our dressers, opened it up, pushed away some underwear, and in the bottom was this little bag, and she started pulling out of it pieces of her most expensive jewelry. I'm like, what's up with this? She says, I'm not going to keep this expensive jewelry in that jewelry box. What if somebody breaks in? They'll, they'll take the jewelry box, but they won't know. I keep this stuff in this junky sock drawer. Oh, I guess if any thieves are watching, I've just put my wife's jewelry in peril. Honey, we're going to have to move it. You see, spiritually, I'm just a sock drawer. I'm no ornate box. I'm just a broken, messed up jar. I'm just a cluttered sock drawer. But let me tell you, inside there is unbelievable treasure because of the grace of God and the gift of Jesus Christ. Let that be your identity and let that be your new glasses this week. One thing before we go, this week I was privileged to be part of an evening where we highlighted six of our young speakers from the Next Gen Preacher Search. These are guys and gals in high school and college who are absolutely fantastic. I wanted to let you know that that now is on YouTube and I want to encourage you to take a look at it. You can do it by simply going to YouTube and Googling Pepperdine Church Relations. It'll take you to our channel and then you can look for it. It should be featured up at the top. It's called Next Gen Voices Night. It's an hour of some fun and, and, and laughter with uh, uh, Eric Wilson of Pepperdine, my son Taylor and I, but also it's encouraging to hear these great young voices. I'd encourage you to share it with your teenagers. Well, the Lord bless you. Put on your glasses and be sure and look at what you can't look at this week. And we'll see you next week. If your churches are open, I pray you're able to go in your state. And um, if they're not, then zoom in and support them. God bless. See you next weekend.